I like the podcast space. I feel like there's like really deep individuals that seek into the podcast arena because they're like really curious about the stories that other people have to offer. And I find that yeah. so innately human, if you yeah. will, yeah. storytelling and story yeah. sharing. Um, so thanks for having me and for allowing yeah, no, me to be a part of it. Yeah, no, we're super happy. Thank you. No, we love it. And and I agree with you. Like you're in someone's, you're in someone's head, you know, in a, in a way, maybe it's, a, it's sort of harking back to the ASMR a little bit, but you, you're like really in someone's ear and, and people can really connect with, with, with that humanness, I think differently on, in audio. So yeah, we also love it, you know, because you're really having to listen on a, on a podcast rather than just see the expressions. You have to like connect in a different way, you know? Well, and most people, don't listen they react because mm. we're so active in that survival state all the time being like inundated with those notifications and the buzzing and the you know emails and the texts and the things dropping yeah. from the sky <laughs> um <laughs> that we tend to listen for a response not listen to one another and hear what's mm. coming through the individual because behind all of our words and everything that we say are uh, intention and intentions yeah. and, and past traumas and past beliefs. And um, I think that's kind of beautiful about what we're doing now is we're just offering that really authentic space to be heard in a world that's mostly concerned with being seen. Um, that's true. I think, I think it's a, I don't know, there's something special about just listening in a conversation and just being participant and observer to uh, another individual's reactions and interactions. Sure. Alrighty, so we are here with Mac Brezina. Thank you so much for joining us on the Ridiculously Human podcast. Thank you for having me. We're really excited to chat with you. We uh, met on Instagram and you were just the most genuine and open human being just from the beginning. So what you see is certainly what you get uh, with you. So, and, and yeah. Gareth and I really always appreciate that. So, so thanks so much. No, it's a pleasure. Um, my running joke is that we're just all human as fuck. Like that's, that's all we're doing. We're just trying to figure it out. Like we don't have it figured out, but we're trying to really hard. Um, <laughs> And I think that's all I really know how to do. So thank you. Cool, you do it really well. So, nice. <laughs> so uh, Mac, to jump right in, you are a self-proclaimed human builder and have gone way beyond what people typically think of as a personal trainer uh, and personal training in general. Um, you actually joke sometimes and you say that you're a professional mom. Um, did you take a bit of the, the coach slash mother figure on because you were the oldest of five growing up? I don't know if that's, I'm, I'm, okay, well, I do know, pause, sidebar. I always <laughs> tell people that, like, don't say you don't know. Like, you do know. You came here with everything <laughs> that you ever needed to know. You do know. So don't say you don't know, because you do. Um, yes, I was the oldest of five. Uh, my siblings were my whole entire world. Um, and I still get nervous about what they think <laughs> about what I do and how I do it. Uh, so they do matter a lot to me. Uh, and I would say that every single one of their personalities and experiences that we've had together absolutely played a part in the coach that I've become, um, mostly because they helped me shape that role of what it meant to be not a soul caregiver, but a caregiver in nature, a caregiver in spirit. Um, when I would go into a, uh, like a job interview or something like that, I'm like, I don't know. I just love taking care of people. Like mm -hmm. I love to make people feel loved and taken care of. And like, that's all I really know. And I would always tell, I'm the oldest of five kids. My siblings are my everything. Like I can take care of people. <laughs> don't worry about it. So we spent a lot of time in the service industry, listening to people's problems while they drank and ate dinner. And, <laughs> um, I also had just like an innate love for psychology and uh, all of that. So I would absolutely say that, I mean, it's, it's a myriad of experiences that have led up to this present moment. And I'm sure that there will be a myriad more that lead up to future present moments. But yeah, they, my whole family has been a huge influence in um, mm. who I am, why I am the way that I am in, in the best way. And uh, specifically who I am as a coach and why I believe in what I do so deeply. Mm. 
What's it like growing up with uh, five <laughs> five siblings? It must be pretty cool. It's loud. <laughs> it's competitive. Really loud. Uh, <laughs> um, did you say complicated stuff? No, no uh, competitive. Like you know, <laughs> uh, we're dinners and I don't. I don't know if we were like competitive in the normal sense of like striving for the same goals, but I think that as a collective, we were all very driven in the direction of whatever lit our hearts up or lights our hearts up. Um, my brother is an incredible athlete and surfer and also has this brain that just won't stop. So he's getting a degree from, of physics from uh, University of California, Santa Barbara. He's like brilliant, kind of like a rocket scientist and super talented. My, I have a sister who is perfect pitch. I have a young sister who loves to dance. I have a sister who is a social justice warrior. Like watching them all objectively makes me go, what the fuck am I doing with my life? <laughs> <laughs> They're amazing. Um, yeah, no, growing up with them, I think it was a lot of tribal mindset, if that makes sense. Like this is our pack. You know what I mean? Um, if anything ever happened to any one of us, one of them was going to step in. Mm-hmm. Does that make sense? Like, yeah. no, you can't say that to my brother. That's my brother. Only I can say that to my brother. Like, I'll step to you. Um, so it's very protective, very bonded. Um, obviously, we all fought like crazy. Um, but they're just magical. I don't know. They inspire me. I think they're really dope. That's awesome. Mm-hmm. That's really cool. And you guys are still close now by the sounds of it. Oh yeah. 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 Absolutely. Mm. Even I, I would say that my, since I've moved from, um, from Los Angeles to St. Petersburg, Florida, it's been a challenge because the, we were so used to being like this. And then I was, you know, I went away to college and came back and then, you know, had my apartment, but it was still close and then moved across the country. And it was this whole like 180. But I would say that at the present moment, we're all really, really close. And, um, even distance. Like I, I speak to them more than I did when I was living in California. Um, social media has been a wonderful thing as well. And, um, we have a family group chat that's been going for probably six or seven years. That's pretty strong. So <laughs> we all kind of chat daily, share yeah. unnecessary information and jokes. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that sounds cool. It's really good to hear when you hear that like families and especially siblings are still really close together. So it's really, mm-hmm. a really nice thing to hear. Um, and you actually, Mac, you grew up near Muscle Beach, uh, which is definitely one of the sort of most iconic places, but also probably one of the most egocentric places in the world. Um, did that affect you at all growing up there? Um, are you talking about Muscle Beach or Los Angeles? Well, uh, Muscle Beach. <laughs> I think that growing up, um, like the Muscle Beach area. So I grew up in Santa Monica and then on the weekends, if I was with my dad, we would, I would ask to go to Venice Beach. Like I loved going to Venice Beach. And I also loved like peeping in and watching the bodybuilding competitions. My dad had several professional bodybuilders as friends and colleagues. Um, so it was very much so part of my ecosystem. He's been a member of Golds in Venice for God, as long as I can remember. Um, but going to Muscle Beach specifically was... So California, (laughs) it's just, yes, is, is California egocentric? Absolutely. Um, does that mean that everyone there is no, but does it mean that it plays with your brain and what you look like and how people are perceiving you? Absolutely. Absolutely. So do you think that's like had an influence on basically what you've ended up doing now? I could argue, well, yes, to answer your question specifically and directly, absolutely. And I would like give that a 1A and answer it that every experience I've ever had, whether it was Mm. positive or negative, has had a integral stitch into the kind of patchwork quilt that I am now. I used to joke and say it was my patchwork, my patchwork cart, like it's been broken and stomped and broken and stomped and broken and stomped and broken and stomped so many times that it kind of gets stitched back together with a new lesson and a new relationship or a new perspective every time that it happens. So when those moments do strike or those moments where I do feel less than, um, I, I step back and remember that those are moments that are moving me forward and are going to be just another piece to the puzzle. But, um, I don't know if I could ever possibly narrow it down to one experience that influenced my present reality. Mm-hmm. Cool. And are there still a lot of people like going there and still doing the whole, 
you know, uh, the stereotypical you oh, know, yeah. walking around at the, you know, fuck, still like, yeah, of course, still the of same course. As we were always, out there yeah. during Christmas, but it was, it was cloudy. I think I went back in March and we stick, we just hung around there and there were all these like big beefy guys, you know, recording their <laughs> vlogs on Venice beach. <laughs> They weren't doing that when I was a kid. They were just like yeah. tan and juiced. But like, <laughs> my dad's like, don't do juice. I'm like, okay, yeah. dad, I won't do juice. <laughs> <laughs> okay, there was a lot of juice flowing there, I'm sure. Uh, yeah, <laughs> like, like early, late 90s, early 2000s, one oh, would assume. <laughs> yeah, big time, man. Eh? Yes. As if it so, Mac, you actually I don't know if it stopped. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, Mac, you actually, um, you know, spoke about your siblings, but you and your dad now, but you also come from a long line of power women. And mm -hmm. uh, can you tell us a bit more about sort of strong female role models and maybe why you think it's important to have them? Oh my God, we could talk about that for like an hour. That's like all that's been on my brain all day has been what it means to be a divine. When I say divine, I don't mean like anything, um, you know, kind of esoteric. I just mean like, like a divine incarnation of what it means to be a woman. Like, what does it mean to be a, a feminine energy in this lifetime because it, it doesn't mean that you are weak it doesn't mean that you are soft it doesn't mean that you have to wear pink and like going to tea it also mm. doesn't mean that you have to be super strong and brutal or aggressive whatever that means you know it's it's about being this beautiful integration of both of knowing that you can stand on your two feet that you can courageously step up to battle whatever that battle might be whether it's micro or macro internal or external um and i think that I, I really had the most magical women to exhibit that to me in my lifetime not just in my immediate family but uh the women that surrounded us were really profound um my grandma specifically uh she it's funny because i'm actually wearing a lion's necklace right now she's my leo she's um She's like this fiery, she, she refers to herself, she goes, hi, I'm Maggie, I'm a Leo. Like she's like very <laughs> pronounced to the fact that she's like a Leo. Like when you walk into her house, there's this big golden lion as soon as you walk into the foyer. Like, she's like, I like luxury. I know what I'm doing. I got my shit together. Like I'm fabulous. Like, yeah, it's grandma. Um, she drove a Jaguar. She had it like, at one point she had a Jaguar XJ like Swarovski hand crystalled by a friend of mine, like in the accents, wow. just because she was fabulous <laughs> and she could. Like, it, she's just amazing. Either way, she uh, started the number one plastic surgery recovery facility to the stars in Beverly Hills um, in the 90s. And it, she took on a myriad of A list patients and mm. created this one of a kind experience with her RN um, for celebrities recovering from, uh, from reconstructive surgery. So she started this thing from the ground up with like maybe $10,000 in her pocket. And I think she had an investor step up, but she just created the whole thing. It was her palace that she built from the ground up and really created this legacy. Um, and then she, when she retired, created a, um, foundation, which is still up and running and now goes by the name Raw, uh, Rebuilding America's Warriors. It still provides the same service of reconstructive, uh, reconstructive surgeries for uh, servicemen and women returning from the wars. Wow. I hate the fact that I have to use that as a plural. Mm -hmm. um, my mom is an all around badass, uh, super badass. She divorced my dad uh, with two kids at the age of like 28 or something. And I'm 25. So that's absolutely insane to me um she was an incredible single mom uh and then wound up meeting my stepdad they had two beautiful kids and then she started her own business um doing photography for weddings and events and uh headshots and things of that nature and i watched her build the entire thing from the ground up like when she got her new equipment when she got her computer mm. when she sat there with someone to figure out how to use a Mac operating system. Like mm. she, within her first wedding, it was kind of this like Cinderella story. Her photos were on Martha Stewart, which is insane. Mm. And then she became an international wedding photographer where people were flying her around the world to shoot their weddings and they were being printed wow. by like these really high level individuals. And then she had an accident where she world knocked her down literally. Um, and 
she has since battled with a complex regional pain syndrome, which is a degenerative disease of the central nervous system. So like I said, when we have all of these uh, patchwork uh, mm. experiences that make up who I am, this was definitely one of them, um, and spurred my fascination with the brain and uh, the central nervous system itself, mm. So, which is the epicenter of everything that I teach now. So she was bedridden for anywhere from five to six years, and that was that's a whole other narrative. Um, but now, since her procedures, it, she's had like 20 plus procedures, it's insane. And um, since she's had a, a stem cell transplant and it has revolutionized her world. Like when I went wow. home for the holiday, she was actually walking around and hanging up stuff on the Christmas tree. And that was really magical. Um, so she has just developed her own foundation to parlay uh, out of my grandma's foundation called Veterans in Pain. And it's mm. a, a foundation that provides pro bono uh, stem cell solutions to veterans returning from the wars as well. Wow. That's wow. awesome. That is one. Yeah, they're pretty cool. I was going to yeah. say, <laughs> there is one power line above uh, ladies yeah. in your family, that's for sure. Maybe that's like why I don't stop working because I'm like, these shoes, they're so big. I have to fill them. <laughs> keep digging, so keep mining. Said, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Wow. 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 So, so talking about your mom, actually, um, you know, just to give a little bit of background, you were, you were always like very into sort of acting and human condition in general when you were younger. And you were, you, at one stage, you had a scholarship at Arizona State uh, to study anthropology, among many other things. And, but because of a tragic, yeah. So I got my, uh, just quick fact check, sorry. I got my uh, degree, my scholarship at Arizona State was for broadcast journalism uh -huh. and to study mass media communications. But while I was there, I was fascinated with anthropology and um, psychology specifically. And then once I transferred out of there, my love for anthropology really took flight. Uh -huh. Ah, uh, cool stuff. Cool. Well, thanks. Thanks for that uh, correction. Yeah, um, no worries. But 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 basically, um, because of the tragic accident uh, your mom was involved in, it sounded like you ended up dropping out and, and going back home to help a sister. Um, so like, how was that sort of reality check for you? So there's layers to this because while yes, I moved back, I didn't stop going to school. I was still in school, but I decided to go the community college, commu why can't I make words? The community <laughs> college route, um, where I really focused for about a year and a half, two years on interpersonal communications um, with the occasional film studies because I'm a big movie nerd. Mm -hmm. But when I left, it was a combination of my mom needed help with, I was in a toxic relationship with my anxiety and depression had reached an all-time low and lost all of my friend dynamics kind of all at once by my own doing. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So it was like this fucked up season of turmoil where I felt it was more beneficial for me to be near home um, and still pursue my goals and um, aspirations professionally. Um, and as a student, because that will always be a first for me, always being a student. But I also didn't want to completely drop out. And unfortunately, after that year and a half and two years, I did end up officially dropping out uh, for about two more years. Hmm. Okay. Well, what, what, what's been what, a tough time of, yeah. Yeah. What, what brought on okay. sort of all your anxiety and depression? I think we're still figuring that out. Um, it's, <laughs> it's so funny because someone will come to me, like flipping this on a client dynamic. If someone came to me and they're like, where did my anxiety and depression come from? I'd be like, well, I'm sure it was one experience and then your brain just watered the fuck out of it and made it grow all these weeds. <laughs> like, you know, it's never just one thing, like I said, but it was definitely a series of unhealthy dynamics unhealthy behaviors, really unhealthy beliefs of myself. Like I was not in a good place. I didn't know what I was 
worth at all. Self-worth wasn't even a dialogue. It was more of like, okay, let, let's get through the day and see if you can not talk shit to yourself. Like mm. what? Um, having, whoa, Kira. She's interesting. Yo. <laughs> um, I, I would like look at them. Like people don't realize how bad it was. Like I, I would overtrain, undereat, count every calorie. Like this is all just in that season. Like it's just all there um what actually set it off if, if i were to sum it up i would probably say this belief that i wasn't enough and the fear of never getting there hmm. does that make sense yeah and then having that compounded with all of these dynamics that affirmed those fears wow and you, you're always finding things to affirm that i guess when you're in that state aren't you that's just the problem when you battle with your brain is that you're constantly seeking affirmation for one reason or another. You're like, am I enough yet? Am I enough yet? That's become a running joke. Like when I'm getting ready in the morning, I'm like, oh, am I, am I enough yet? Like if you can make a joke about it, it makes it a lot easier. Um, sorry, they shouldn't have given me a stool chair. Um, but yeah, no. I, I think that not knowing who you are coupled with not being comfortable and where you found yourself is a deathly combination to a healthy mind or to a mind with a lot of potential. Mm. That, that makes sense. Yeah. We can come. Yeah. Um, and unfortunately I think as a woman, it can be double time because there is so much pressure in this external validation. Mm. Whereas the more masculine energy is focused on ensuring protection and providing in that external space, the female is looking to be affirmed, accepted and desired in that external space. Whereas on the flip side of that, I think women are more a, I don't know if they're more able or if there's just greater allowance for a woman to have a healthier intrinsic space, an internal dialogue, an internal um, communication with their emotions, with their thoughts, with their beliefs. And I think that for men, they find it's a lot more difficult to have a healthier intrinsic dynamic versus their external. So does that turn into more of the stuff that you're working with with men, like the, the internal dialogue in terms of like their worth and their mess, like what they identify as their masculine and that kind of stuff. Yeah. It's very interesting. I get a lot of men that are conventionally, when I say highly masculine, I don't mean men or women. I mean, masculine in energy, right? Like I have a lot of masculine energy for a female, meaning I come off as like, I, I fuck with me. Like I'll step to you. Like, you know, I got my, my ducks in a row. Like, you know, I, that kind of, I don't need you sort of energy right? Which is becoming more and more and more prevalent in women in my generation. Um, when it comes to speaking to my men and them exploring what that masculine energy means to them, um, it often comes coupled with this discovery that they are really seeking and desiring a greater relationship and connection with that feminine within them. And the feminine isn't femme at all. It's nurturing, it's kindness, it's love, it's compassion, it's um, giving yourself the nurturing, loving energy that any human being deserves, whether you have a dick or not. <laughs> totally. <laughs> totally. And, you know, I can imagine that th these kind of uh, concepts for a lot of people are becoming more like mainstream, but uh, I'm sure a lot of people are still trying to wrestle with like understanding that they have these little this family basically inside of them that are, of different personalities that they can sort of tap into and and start to see and nurture which which people don't necessarily always think about they just think this is me as a whole but there's all these little, little, little sort of facets that we can nurture and and understand i love that you said it's a family of personalities because hmm. i it's just such a beautiful illustration because when we talk about spirituality or, or faith, like you see the incarnation of the image of man expressed as a God, but it's just what exists within man that they're trying to put words to. 
if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. And realizing that all of these different shades and variations and contours, kind of what makes this good, good lighting, right, mm -hmm. is exists within us. And that is what gives us depth. And that is what, what makes us magical. And that's mm -hmm. what is missing when it comes to exclusively looking at the fitness industry or what your meat suit looks like. Like mm. it's only going to get you like 10% of the way there. Like there's so much here and here. And when you start getting these talking and creating a relationship between those personalities, man, you're limitless. <laughs> I love that. Now you, you, you briefly spoke about, you know, the anxiety and depression, you, you call these your de dementors. Um, but uh, you also had sort of a little bit of a family history. There was a lot of people around you dealing with anxiety and depression as, mm -hmm. as well. And, and what are some of your thoughts on like the sort of genetic versus environmental aspects of, of these kinds of afflictions? Again, a topic I could talk about forever uh, because <laughs> what you're asking me about is ancestral trauma, right? Like, yeah. which can't, we could talk about this in a, in a really woo woo context, or we could talk about this in a really grounded context. So I, I always like to walk somewhere in the middle. Um, yeah. Just like hang out there and like, oh, like oh. bridging the gap, You're bridging a good gap, there. bridging it a little bit. Um, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> um, especially when I get in dynamics like this, like my energy gets really high, and so I try to keep it, keep it grounded. Um, so when it comes to dealing with family members that have experienced anxiety or depression because i want to take a moment to note that anxiety depression panic are all temporary experiences that the brain is seeking a solution to and it's oftentimes a problem that has not happened yet or it's a rehashing of a problem that happened in the past from the limbic system and all the brain is ever actually doing is using this prefrontal cortex to recall into the limbic system into that sympathetic space, mm -hmm. your primal monkey brain, right? Your primal brain, conscious monkey brain. Prefrontal cortex does the labeling, the decision-making, and then the limbic system is where we store all of our trauma because it's right above the amygdala or incorporates mm -hmm. the amygdala, which is responsible for eliciting your fear-based responses, which is all anxiety, depression, and panic disorders are. So I don't believe that anybody is truly disordered unless there is a physiological inhibitance, complication, rewiring that is beyond the human being's control. I am of the belief system, especially now in this present reality, that all human beings have infinite potential to not only comprehend their mind, but to practice what I call mind control. So do I believe that it can be passed down through generation? Yes, because if it has been experienced generations prior, it's slowly generation by generation making an impact on the genealogy being passed down through that ancestry. So I know for a fact, because I've asked, and I always encourage individuals to be curious and wonder and ask, I've asked my family about the history of mental wellness in, in our life and in our mm. family line. Um, and it is present on both sides. I have a great grandfather who's one of my guardians that unfortunately attempted suicide. Um, I have a history of mental illness, mental illness. On my father's side, there's a distinct difference between mental illness and, and mental health also that I want to point out. Um, I believe that those genealogies can be manifested by the individual by being passive to their own potential. Hmm. Does that make sense? So can it be passed down through generations? Absolutely. But if it can be passed down through generations, that means that if an individual chooses to change that narrative, that can also be passed down through generations. So it is a energetic, physiological, cognitive, and spiritual rewiring that is nothing if not deliberate choice over and over and over and over and over and over and over, and over again because those preconditioned beliefs are still going to be there probing you in the back of your mind. And so making a deliberate choice to change um, your pathway, 
your neural pathways and your life path is um, it's a human right, but it's seldom accessed, I believe. Totally. And, and what do you mean about the difference between mental illness and mental health? So I believe this is sort of what I said before that mental illness to, in my experience and in my belief system would be someone that has a physiological condition either centered in their mind or their body's inability to communicate with the mind that is beyond the individual's control that requires outside medical attention. That's what I would consider like a mental illness. Mental health is something we all deal with and we can cut the bullshit and pretend like we don't. Like all of us, especially with the rapid evolution of technology have developed this innate sense of stress and lack that we are not enough, that we must Mm -hmm. try harder, work harder, show up more, do more, you know, look better. We're a visually stimulated uh, species now with our ever scrolls. Mm -hmm. So mental health Mm -hmm. is a human condition and it's something that deserves attention daily, male or female Mm -hmm. or anything in between. I don't judge. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> it's it's so true it's uh I, I really like what you're saying there and i think also um i also like the p- positive spin of mental health you know like it's so easy to always go towards like you know in the modern medical world it's sort of you often hear about everybody you know, wants a diagnosis. diagnosis yeah the diagnosis the sickness the whatever's and it's actually let's let's look, talk about how to model the healthy people how, how to be um, more like that, but also with the understanding that we all have tough times, and uh, I think that's that's a really good way to look at things. You know, I, I think it's a real practical way of feeling, yeah, not just going to the negative always. You know, oh, well, and I think that we're so predisposed to assume the negative, like especially if you've battled with anxiety. Or, I call them brain bullies or dementors, whatever you want to call them, mm-hmm. gremlins. I don't know, little monsters that are running your brain because they're not you; they're just like planted by somebody else and you're just letting them live there um which you're allowed to do it's a choice but if you're aware of them don't you also kind of like want to get rid of them Mm. i just be me i don't know yeah totally Totally. i don't know it's an interesting um it's an interesting time to be alive as a human being i think because we have so much being asked of us Mm. and yet nobody's showing up for one another and that's something I'm hopefully trying to change a little bit with how we interact on social media. Um, because I don't think that social media is a, an option anymore. It's not if, it's how. Yeah. So, yeah. Good point. Humans so, are, are looking for something else always. Like, why not flip that and be like, hey, dude, remember, you're awesome and you came here with all the answers that you needed. Just wanted to let you know. <laughs> Just popping up. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> so, so Matt, to- I was just going to say, like, uh, talking about like positive spins, uh, you say that you can be anxious, you can be upset, you can be heartbroken or in mourning, but you can still evolve and be a better person. Tell yeah. us more about what you mean about that. Isn't that where evolution happens, where it doesn't feel good? Mm. Right? Can I use this lovely little moment to share with you my favorite metaphor that I give to clients ever? Please. Okay. Yeah, please. So I, I like butterflies. I think they're phenomenal. I think that they are a really, really good metaphor for what we're talking about. So caterpillars, if you've ever happened to see one, um, are bottom feeders. Like they, they live on the ground and they, they eat dirt. Like <laughs> not doing so great they're not really <laughs> conscious they're not aware they're not like where are my other caterpillar buddies they're like no i'm just like doing my long. thing <laughs> being a caterpillar right and then at some point it goes um i think i need to grow hmm. i need to evolve and my favorite fun fact because i've written about this is that the caterpillar actually pulls its transformation out of its asshole it pulls the cocoon out of its butt and then it spins the cocoon around itself not knowing why it's not looking for the future it's not looking to the past it's just like i think i'm gonna spin this stuff out of my butthole now and i'm gonna sit in it for a while and then i don't know what 
what's gonna happen, but um, I'm just gonna stay here. And it never worries about when it's gonna get out of the cocoon. It doesn't worry about if it's a butterfly yet. It's just a caterpillar that pulled some stuff out of its ass and it's sitting in a cold, dark space. <laughs> and then at some point, some point, he like gets uncomfortable, you know? Cause he's like too big for the cocoon. And then the wings kind of push out, and like some movement happens. He's like, this doesn't feel good anymore. Maybe I should get out. And then he gets out, and he's like, what the fuck are these things on my back? Like, what do I do with that? <laughs> Why? How? And then it doesn't fly right away. It just hangs out there for a bit. It's like, whoa, got to get some stability. These are some new adjustments. I feel fabulous. <laughs> And then it innately takes flight when it's ready and not a minute before. Mm -hmm. Do you know how long a butterfly lives? No. Like less than 72 hours. Wow. I never knew that. So what does that tell you about your, your individual evolution in general? Like where are you going to spend the most amount of time? Hmm. Either as a caterpillar or in a cocoon. Wow. Right? So really, one, what where's the rush? Who are you mm. you're, who are you comparing yourself to? Why are these barometers even in your psyche? Like it's not that important. It's your journey to take flight, no matter how long it takes you, where it takes you, where you make your cocoon, because the plot twist is once you die at that butter, butterfly stage, you get to become a caterpillar again. And do it over and over and over and over and over again. And I instill this into my clients very, very early on because I'm like, listen, I'm here to remind you that A, you don't need me. B, you're invincible. But most importantly, it doesn't stop here. You have to keep going. You have to keep growing. You don't stop at one summit. You stand there and go, oh, look at that. That's a motherfucking mountain range. Like, that's pretty nice. Guess I'll do it again. You know? Sorry, you froze. No, Are we okay? We, we, we're good. We're good. We're There's just listening. Okay, cool. Um, so I don't know. I think that I don't think there's a finish line. And I if there is one, it's definitely it's definitely not being a butterfly. Mm. It's the metamorphosis process, the evolution process. I love that. And we're always so focused on the butterfly, aren't we? That's like, that's just our whole lives. Like this idea of the butterfly and what, what even is the butterfly? What even does that mean for you? Like half the time, you're not even sure of that. And And how do you know if you're there or not? Yeah. Yeah. You don't, you never will. Yeah. Regardless of how much money is in your bank account, whether or not you have abs, like it doesn't, It doesn't matter. That's not why you're doing it. That's not why an athlete goes to the gym. An athlete goes to the gym to challenge themselves, to fight them within in the best way, to challenge, loving, challenge them within. That's what an athlete is. And we tend to think when our heart's broken and we sad and mourning, like you like Gareth was saying, you know, that those are the times where we just feel our least uh, self-worth but actually if we, we spin that around we, we start understanding that this is really important stuff for for becoming that butterfly those are the moments yeah, yeah. those are the moments where you step back and go okay i'm not perfect okay i'm still experiencing a human experience i'm feeling it all feel it all as long as it's temporary and observe it what is it teaching you about yourself it's never a negative experience if a lesson comes out of it and the faster you find the lesson the faster you can move on with your life Mm. like it's with respect to you know deep emotional processing i think there's something to be said for that too at one stage, you were, you know, like you mentioned, now you were sort of at a bad stage uh, mentally, and and that's when sort of training entered the sort of uh, scene for you, and and specifically boxing um, affected and impacted you in a positive way. 
um, sort of like what was and, and what is the role of exercise for you and for other people dealing with anxiety and depression in your opinion? Humility and interconnectedness. Um, I learned in boxing that it's not about what I look like. Like your bank account doesn't fucking matter when you're ass deep in a workout and you're pouring sweat and worried about whether or not you're going to bomb it. You know what I mean? Like the, it, it shuts this monkey brain up long enough for you to just feel and be that it allows me, it, it's been quite the evolution. My relationship with fitness has been quite an evolution and it's still an evolution. Um, but to sum it up in a boxing context, there's a reason why boxers train with shadow boxing. Like their opponent is not mm -hmm. the individual across from them. It's themselves, mm -hmm. you know, and they're either shadow boxing their actual shadow. They're either shadow boxing, playing pretend and just staring off into space or they're standing in a mirror and like looking face to face. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, that was what was most powerful for me was learning that it wasn't about combat and it also wasn't about contact it wasn't about making contact like i always, i wanted to show how powerful i was because i felt like i had been for so long mm. that I, I wanted to be strong let me be strong let me be strong but i hate my body but let me be strong but i hate myself but let me be strong mm. and i got through a lot of really dark spaces by leaving it on the mat and leaving it on a bag um mm. but i also learned a lot about myself and what it means to slow down and what it means to observe yourself and to be present within yourself and to know that at any given moment someone is training harder to beat you faster and to show up like i was training five days a week two hours a day and then had to tone it down you know what i mean mm. um but it's it taught me a lot about leadership it taught me a lot about self-leadership and self-respect um and it taught me a lot about my strength as a woman too mm. like i know that i can walk down the street at any given point in time and day and like nobody's gonna fuck with me mm. and if they tried to they'd be sorry <laughs> it's it's interesting how that energy you know that you carry a certain energy when you have this so, certain knowing in your own body about yourself and that self-confidence as you're talking about and and that's why people don't mess with you because you you it's the energetics of it you know but i'd like to know like you spoke about the shadow uh, shadow boxing, but obviously your the subtext there is we all have yeah. a shadow and, and we're all dealing oh, yeah. with that um, with that. So like why people put so much into the shadow and we we don't really want to shine a light there too much. Um, Are you asking in a spiritual context or in a in a yeah. more practical context? context? This is like a highly spiritual question. Like that's, that's yes. what I'm asking. No, this is a spiritual um, question. So well, I mean it's also like spiritual it's but it's also question, right? it's a very human question yeah because we yeah we have so many contexts um and stories and we live in as we spoke about before we started recording was like we are individuals but we want to be but we also in a world where we with other people right. and so we store stuff in the way we in our shadow or whatever it is because we think that's the correct way um right. how do you how do you help people like sort of uh, shine a light on that shadow and and do you use exercise as that sort of work as oh well? yeah Oh my God. Yeah. Cause that's okay. So I used to not have, we're going to talk about my shadow as though she's like a real person. Mm -hmm. Um, she was like, and we all have one and I bet you anything, like at this given point in time, as I'm like starting to like peel her away, you're starting to wow. Like what would my shadow look like? Like, what would his name be? How did he, you know, how did he act? What did he say? What did he do? And mine was heavily it is cause she is, what the shadow is, is kind of this manifestation of the human ego. And when we talk about the human ego, we're just talking about the metaphysical representation of fear, right? We talked about early on with what triggers anxiety and depression. And we can look at a shadow and say, I'm all love and light now. My shadow doesn't exist. And I'd be like, you're so full of shit. <laughs> like, there's no way. Because that would mean that there is some sort of pure existence. And I don't believe that that's real. I think that our shadow is what allows us to make mistakes. Our shadow is what 
tries to protect us, much like the ego does. It's always going, hey, remember that last time you did this and, and we did X, Y, Z to make sure that you didn't die. And then it's like, okay, like, let's do that again. And, mm -hmm. and let's keep doing that because you never die when we try that. But if you stay there in that safety region, which is like this, and then you have all of your unlimited potential, which expands infinitely out this way. If you stay here, you're solely living in shadow. And I would argue that if you're in a dark room, and I'm 25 years old and afraid of the dark, because it's also because I'm a mystic, and I'm like, I know what's in there, I don't like it. <laughs> um, if you're in pitch darkness, pitch black darkness, no light, no windows, nothing, and you light one candle, that's how that shadow is going to disperse. So we could fear our shadow because it's big and dark and scary and is all of these things that we don't like about ourselves. Or all of, and you could choose to not like them and that's fine. Or you could choose to accept them and be like, wow, look at all of these opportunities that I have to grow and light more candles in this darkness. Does that make sense to you? Yeah, so absolutely. the shadow isn't something that we should separate from at all. Like when I think of the shadow, I think of Peter Pan and him mm. sewing the shadow on. He's like, shadow, like I can't do anything without my shadow. It's part of you. Yeah. And the more grounded context of this is uh, shadows and contrast in your personality, in your daily life, positive and negative experiences, the positive and negative thoughts that you share in your mind. Um, it's a lot like lighting in a gym. Without the shadows, you wouldn't get the definition. You know what I mean? It doesn't give you the cut-ins of your hard work. Um, and I've just recently come out of like a darker period of my life, which was fine. It just, life just kind of happened. Um, where I feel like I'm kind of entering a new season where I'm bringing my shadow with me and really loving her for all that she is and freeing her of judgment so that she doesn't cast that judgment onto others. Mm. Mm. Yeah. yeah, that's what I think of a shadow. Really meaningful. Thank you for sharing that. It's so, so powerful. You've, um, you've also sort of off the back of this, and I think it's, it's kind of quite pertinent talking about ego and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, just delving into the shadow and also just mental health in general you've dabbled with psychedelics in the past and, and CBD and, and, and these kinds of things. Um, obviously slightly different compounds, but at the same time, they're, they're sort of linked. Um, has there, there's been a lot of talk about treatment for, you know, or treatments also a bit of a strong word here, but you know, treatment for depression and, but how have these sort of compounds helped you with, with maybe uh, your mental health, but also just um, in general? changed my life <laughs> they they completely changed my life um and i want to take a moment like little soapbox psa moment um just because people on the internet are doing it and talking about consciousness and acting like they know what they're doing and you know it's the cool new thing right now and everybody's dropping mm. them at you know different music festivals i want to yeah. take a moment and say like on the record to step into that phase of exploration with diligent respect. Mm. I encourage copious amounts of research um, and to not do it in excess recreationally mm. because to me, that's a dishonor to the wisdom that they bring. Fully. So just my little whoa sorry i'm not i'm used to talking with my hands i'm not used to talking with this <laughs> dick in my face um <laughs> microphone uh no i think that psychedelics can be tremendously beneficial tremendously beneficial when done right here's what's interesting about psychedelics if an individual is not in a conscious place to allow the release of their conscious awareness from their physical being if they are not there, they will not experience the psychedelic. Mm. It won't happen. It will be a complete placebo effect. What's also interesting, though, is that they found in research that individuals in the same set, in the same setting, because it's under research, mm. all have different experiences. 
So when I say that you're your own puzzle piece, you're your own goddamn puzzle, period. Mm. You're unique and, and everything that your brain has ever seen, experienced, sensed, dreamt is yours, entirely yours, which means that if you step into the psychedelic world of any varietal, it's going to be entirely yours. And if you are aware enough, if you're down with your shadow enough, if you're down with discomfort and neurological comfort, uh, let me rephrase that. If you're okay with neurological, psychological, and spiritual confrontation in a loving mm. way, in a constructive way, it can be very beneficial. If you mm. are still afraid of your own shadow, don't touch them because you're not yeah. ready. Totally. Does that make sense? Yeah. What it feels like, if someone is asking me, what does a psychedelic feel like? This is something that I talk to my clients about regularly um, with responsible um monitoring i also encourage anyone if you're genuinely interested in doing this for a therapeutic basis to seek out someone who does professionally guided experiences mm. so a hypnotherapist um a psychologist uh even a religious or spiritual leader that you can confide in and feel comfortable with um i would encourage that before i would encourage asking joe schmo or your friend to mm. you know take care of you while you're tripping. Like that's, mm. that's not what I'm talking about at all. I'm talking about a very deliberate seeking of information um, and adventure into the subconscious and beyond. Mm, I love it. And, and you said that the, the psychedelics like changed your life, right? But like, mm -hmm. like how, how did it change it? Like what was your experience? It showed me I wasn't a prisoner to my brain. Mm. That my brain was not the one in control. Um, it showed me that in our world, we believe that we are crazy. We believe that we're not enough. And we get so attached to the voice we hear in our heads that we identify with. But as we've just established, that's the ego trying to keep you alive, right? That's your narrative playing, going, hey, you know, look both ways before you cross the street so you don't die. <laughs> Do X, Y, Z so that you don't die. That's all it's ever doing. And it sounds really um, watered down, but that's, I mean, that just kind of sums it up. But for me, it felt like if you've ever taken a water pick to your teeth or gone to the dentist and they like get all the gunk and the bullshit out of your teeth, that's what it did for my brain. Mm -hmm. And it showed me that there was an alternate experience that was within me that was present in me that i could build a bridge to anytime i needed to because that is why we do this we if we are exploring in the psychedelic space what we're doing is stepping into an experience that is going to give you information for you to take a step forward in your human experience by anchoring your spirit into this physical existence so it's going to show you some lesson that you can take with you so that you can continue towards that next phase of growth or butterfly metamorphosis. Hmm. Uh, so for me, it showed me that I was capable, showed me that I was not a victim and that magic is totally real. Wow. <laughs> That's beautiful. Yeah. And I think what, you know, people like Terrence McKenna speak about and stuff is exactly what you're saying is like, these compounds, these medicines, these teachers, yeah, they're ancient. There's a lot of wisdom in them. And basically they dissolve boundaries in terms of the ego. So we can suddenly you often feel connected to source or to one another and to mother earth. And, and that makes you a lot more humble and, and maybe brings a little bit more of that feminine art again, because you realize it's okay to, to be nice to one another. It's not all about um, the, the ego is very much, this is my house, this is my car, this is my, 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 my. Well, the ego, is, again, is just know? trying to create separate space to keep yeah. you safe. That's exactly. all it's trying to do. And people say, yeah. abandon your ego. You need to experience an ego death. Like, don't do it like it has a physiological purpose. It has yeah. to stay there, you know? Um, I didn't mean to cut you off, but... No, no, no. no. Um, but, that's yeah. true. but the witnessing of it is still important. It's still, and I think it's, that's what I think psychedelics can do like to say how home. much of this. Yeah, yeah. It feels right. like returning home, mm. away from the human that you've been conditioned to be. Mm. Like you're not victim to this existence. You get to be here. Quit your bitching. 
Yeah, you true. know what I mean? <laughs> you get to be here and you have a purpose. Your odds of existing are one in a trillion. Better show up for the other humans that need you because God damn it, we need to do this together. Hmm. And, and we're kind of like talk, talking about this, I guess, quite openly, like, you know, like psychedelics and things. And I guess if I had to mention this, say to my parents, they would look at me quite strangely. But why do you think people are so afraid to kind of uh, tackle these kind of topics? The same reason they were afraid in the 1960s, because it freed people of their minds. And mm. I think the powers that be don't like that too much. Mm. Most definitely if that makes sense. Um, I've read, I mean, God, if I showed you my library, um, I think I did show you my library. You showed me, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so Timothy Leary, Ram Dass, obviously like the godfathers, right? Um, when they started bringing this exploration into the mainstream in the early 60s, um, it kind of went zero to 100 really fast where Leary was telling his students to literally abandon their homework and curriculum and go home and drop acid. Um, right. and then you have Ken Kesey with the electric Kool-Aid acid test and he goes across the U S doing, you know, acid in abundance and, and bringing it to the, bringing it to the masses. Right. right. Um, I think that there's something to be said for a healthy amount of regulation. I also think that there's something to be said for a, albeit mystical substance that you can't exactly quantify. Um, because the ex no two experiences will ever be exactly alike, um, regardless of set and setting, but odds are set and setting are never going to be exactly alike because no mm. two moments are exactly alike. Um, I also think that it's important to acknowledge the state of mental wellness of the individual going into the experience, not only within themselves, but within their relationship with the outside world or this concept of something higher. Um, humans are ego-driven individuals, which means again, that we like to be individual, even though we are pack animals. Mm -hmm. So um, it can be very confronting. It can be very uh, uncomfortable, but if you're prepared to kind of surrender and just experience whatever it is for you. And I guarantee you, you're going to learn something <laughs> Yeah, <that's true>. about <laughs> yourself or others. <laughs> or both. That's so true. You can, you know, you can meditate your way to these kinds of uh, insights, I'm sure too. But one thing about the psychedelics is that you will be shown something like you say. So there's a, there's a good guarantee yeah. there. It's, so, you, you, once you see it, you cannot see it is kind of how I put it. And I obviously I would encourage anyone take your steps first. You know what I mean? Get your body right first, get your routine mm. right first, get your meals right first, get your brain yeah. right before you do any of that. And then venture into that world of psychedelic exploration. Like don't go looking for yourself. You're not, I love that. I get sent it by followers and by my, my clients regularly. Um, it's like this thing like don't stop looking for yourself you're not lost mm -hmm. you know you're not a lost sock you're not a lost wallet like you're here you're mm -hmm. all all of you is here right now which is whether or not you choose to be present enough to acknowledge it mm -hmm. i like that that's good advice so talking about some of the advice that you that you that you give and i think you give really mm -hmm. sound advice um so you know so many people see personal trainers in one way shape or form and personal trainers in general impact many lives because they have, they're like a first port, port of call, you know? Um, so it's amazing that you sort of taking this role to the next level and um, it's sort of very human level, but what, what in your opinion uh, is maybe wrong or could be improved with personal training, generally speaking in your, in your opinion? I don't have time to answer this question. <laughs> <laughs> We've had a lot of those um, questions. <laughs> uh, man. Man. Okay. If you, if you are a personal trainer stepping into this world inundated by the spit, fitspo existence, which makes me so itchy because it's not what the industry is about. Mm. Find what made you want to get fit. What made you step through the gym? And what do you think makes you, you? And who do you like to train and why? Mm. 
what individual, if you could like create the perfect individual and sit them in front of you and be like, that's my perfect client, who would they be? And then do that shit really, really well and be a student, read, learn, play with other coaches, explore, don't limit yourself to one modality. Um, people think that because bodybuilding is what's big on Instagram, that's what they need to do to be a certified personal trainer. You get any monkey can get a certified personal trainer cert certificate. Becoming a coach takes balls. Does that make sense? That takes like a willingness to hold yourself to a level above your clients and still being grounded enough to be there for them through every step of their journey because th it's their journey, not yours. It's not about what they can do for you. It's about you showing up for them as the individual that they need and then being there every minute of the session, no questions asked, fully focused and committing yourself, not just to their best possible transformation, but to yours as well, which is why I coach a lot of coaches or leaders or people looking into going into this industry because we need good humans. Mm. There's so many not so good ones. I'm trying to pick my words carefully. Like it's hard <laughs> for me to be in a conventional gym nowadays. It's genuinely difficult because of how bad it is. Hmm. It's, it seems, in my opinion, the industry has evolved into being highly self-righteous, seeking instant gratification, and unnecessarily toxic and competitive. Hmm. Like the only thing that we are actually trying to do is build better humans. That's it either physically, mentally, or emotionally, however you've fallen into this fitness and wellness industry. Um, because fitness and wellness are not the same thing. You can be fit and not be well, and you can be well and not be fit. Um, True. But I think that the most important thing for any coach to understand is their superpower, first of all, and that they are worth being taken care of, um, receiving care. They're, they're worthy of having their cup filled up too. Mm. You know what I mean? That's something I, I really, really preach to a lot of my other coaches, my, my other human builders in the making, that um, they have to, have to, have to put themselves first. Otherwise, their client will suffer. How do you fill your cup up? Mm, for me, how do I fill my cup up? It's kind of a daily rendezvous. Do you know what I mean? It's like a daily experience. Um, if I like, could line up my steps, I love doing yoga. I've fallen absolutely in love with doing yoga. Um, so I'll either do it on my front porch, like a weirdo with like a sage stick going, like stones <laughs> out. <laughs> like I'm a card reader too. So I'll, I'll pull tarot. That helps me get right into a present space, a present state of being. Um, and really just being with my family, like, I have more fun folding the laundry with Trevor or going for a long walk than I ever could, you know, spending an ass load of money to go to an expensive dinner or on clothes or anything. Like I enjoy deep conversation. I enjoy reading. I enjoy journaling and drawing. Um, I'm really a hippie and barefoot as we speak. So <laughs> I guess like just taking time to hang out with myself and kind of make up for lost time. I think, I think I didn't like her for a long time. I'm really <laughs> digger. Hey! <laughs> I can't get mine up there. You can't get to us, Greg. <laughs> Sorry. That's your feet, man. Gotta do more yoga. Yeah, I gotta get my yoga going. <laughs> uh, that's oh, classic. classic. I love it. Yeah, I think those are such like those important are... lessons and great lessons, actually. Like, you know what? You keep things simple, you know what I mean? And, and you mm -hmm. can find some, some real, like, good place in your life, you know? Like, uh, just do those small things, like the journaling um, spending time with your family and really connecting and being present and like people just overcomplicate it though, you know, when they're looking for that wellness yeah. and that peace and all yeah. those. Sort of I don't know why I'm like, mm. who's holding a gun to your head saying you got to lose 20 pounds in 30 days. Mm. Like mm. I'll send like, the hitman, but like who, who's doing that to mm. you? Oh, it's mm. you. Okay. Well, maybe we should stop that. Mm. You know what I mean? Um, I, I preach that to my clients very much so. I don't want to say preach, but like that's something that's a theme that comes up um, about just enjoying the simple steps. Take pride in your small steps. Be in your little steps. Like that's when the best moments of a rep happen. You know what I mean? It's not the full contraction. It's when you're like holding it really hard and that isometric 
pulled. You know what I mean? It's um, adding just a little bit more weight or just showing up every day or just trying something new. It's, it's about being okay with the little sample size moments of life mm -hmm. and not looking for that grandiose finish line. It doesn't exist. You're going to be so let down. Yeah, 100%. And I think there's something to be said um, for consciously acknowledging or reminding yourself that no two moments are exactly alike. That means that whatever present moment you've chosen to be in, whatever moment you found yourself in, is entirely unique and catered to your energy based on your choices, beliefs, and everything that's led you to that moment. So if you don't soak it up, you're never going to get it back. Mm. powerful oh, okay. wow that's pretty powerful and, and you and you mentioned like going into gyms now like it's something that you struggle and and uh mm -hmm. i'm also assuming that your your business has like transitioned uh you know to much more online now um how was that for you was it a sort of easy transition or was it emotionally quite difficult? it was really hard emotionally it was really hard um I love personal training. I brought back personal training part-time uh, a few days a week because I needed to be grounded. And like working online is great. I love it. I love, love, love my online program. I will tell, I'll, I'll share with you a bit about that as well. Um, it's phenomenal, this online program. Like it's, it's so far beyond where I could have ever gotten a client in the gym that I now offer like hybrid versions of it for my personal training clients so that they can do this work too. Mm. Um, so in a personal training setting, uh, I was there every day. I, I was, it was like 6 a.m. to like 10 and then I would go to school because I was finishing my degree and then I would show up from like four to six or sometimes four to seven and then come home and then repeat every day. And I would train in between all of that. Um, so I don't know how the fuck I did it when you back to that way. But it got to a point, at least for my spiritual journey, where my sensitivity was increasing and increasing and increasing. And that meant that I was taking on more and more and more and more and more and didn't quite know how to clear it yet. And I didn't know how to manage my, my space and my energy yet. And I needed to take that retreat. And also when you want to see something grow, like you have to make some sacrifices in order to give it all of the love and attention that it needs to see it through. And thankfully enough, my clients, my clients become family, um, <laughs> were so supportive and loving that they practically pushed me out the door. Like they were really really encouraging about it yeah. and um, really open to it. And I know that some of them are not happy about it, but that's why <laughs> I brought it back as an option. <laughs> um, so no, it wasn't an easy transition. It was a necessary transition and it allowed me to become a better coach because of it. In terms of your days, and like we're going online, like now, do you feel that your days are actually longer um, in terms of your- <laughs> I thought you were gonna say shorter. I'm like, no. <laughs> um do, are my days longer yeah to a degree um it's just different it's just it's very different uh, it's not for everybody and people want to be an online i want to work online i want to do what you do i want to work on the internet and do something I'm like no you fucking don't because you're not willing to show up for all those little steps and those little steps are scheduling, booking, making sure that invoices go out and get fulfilled, making sure that all of their check-ins are gone through, making sure that everybody has workouts if they need them, making sure people know what they need for their supplements and for their nutrition. Like the running joke is that I have probably a couple dozen kids mm -hmm. all around the US and scattered around the UK and Canada. Mm -hmm. Like they're my babies, they're my kids, you know? And I, I think it takes a special kind of crazy to do that. Like I'm up every day. I think I was up today at six and that was like sleeping in. Uh -huh. Yeah. Tomorrow I have a PT session at six 30 and then I'm working through the day and you know, it's coach a client here, uh, do a photo shoot here, come and sit on a podcast. It's everything that we've built and everything we wanted to do. You know, it's just all of my, uh, hobbies and passions kind of twisted into one. And, um, it's magical. And I get to be there through all of the really important phases of my clients' journeys that 
go far beyond just the reps in the gym. I get to do the reps outside. That's cool. You, you speak about the other 23 mm. hours, and I guess that's kind of what you're talking about here, hey? Yeah, it's the other 23 hours of the day where life happens, <laughs> where you're actually going through shit and uh, going through the, those real reps, those shadowy dark reps where you're like, oh, fuck. I mean, I've coached people through a myriad of mental wellness um, battles, uh, interpersonal complications, relational battles. Uh, you name it, I've dealt with it, man. Like, literally, there's nothing that can scare me. And I'm just really passionate about it because I think that every human being deserves this information. And the, the major foundation of that other, the other 23 is um, my nutrition protocols, which are all centered around the gut brain axis. So mm -hmm. it's teaching you intuitive eating, which is a physiological process that does transpire in the brain. It's just whether or not you choose to be conscious of it and then make it your bitch. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, so they all have homework regularly. Every session ends with action steps, really grounded, applicable baby steps that make big differences over long mm. periods of time. And like I said earlier, we fall in love with that constant process of evolution. And so I have clients, the minimum is 12 weeks and people will stay with me. The longest someone has stayed with me at this point is three and a half years. Hmm. Wow. We just keep going. Yeah. I love that. Because I'll, I'll hold them to it. You know what I mean? Like, like no, you got more in you. And they're like, yeah, you're right. <laughs> <laughs> it's not just reaching a point on the scale, is it? It's, it's a lot more God, than that. No. It's, it's, yeah. My clients aren't even allowed to own scales. Nice. I'm like, yeah. why? What is that going to do for you besides make you angry? Yeah. <laughs> It's true. So how do you, how do you help people find true motivation from the inside? Cause that's kind of, you don't want to, I'm assuming you don't want to constantly be motivating from the outside the whole time. Obviously that's somewhat of your role sometimes, but right, 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 right. how do you get them to connect to that? A couple of different ways. So one, the, the type of human that falls into this program never falls into it by accident. It is never, ever, an accident. If I had the time to tell you about how some of these people found me or the signs that led them to signing up, you would be floored. Um, that being said, the individuals that become a part of the program, because there is a, an interview process, like I do want to sit down and talk, to, talk with you and get to know you and make sure that you're a good fit and that you're going to be successful in this process because it's not for everybody. It does ask a lot of an individual. So to some degree, an individual is going to come in with some sort of self-startership. Um, they're, like I said, they're leaders in their, in their environments, in their communities. Um, they're either a coach themselves. A lot of people come in with a background, at least of the foundations of fitness and nutrition. Like, don't eat trash, show up at the gym. <laughs> don't be a dick to yourself, we'll work on the rest. Like, that's like the base, 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 base level. But almost every individual comes in with that sense of, I got this, I love to work out, I just need the motivation to do so. And um, I want to level up. Mm -hmm. Whatever that level is, I don't know what it is, but I need to step up. I need to step it up for myself from within. And that process towards intrinsic motivation is really particular to the individual. I don't know that I have a process for teaching people that skill set. I think it's built through our relationship and exploration of, for lack of a better term, what makes them tick. Mm. And picking these things out. And I think the more, just like a workout, you start working out, and you're like, that hurts. And then, you know, three months in, you're like, it feels good. Like, that's kind <laughs> of how we work. Like, like it. it starts off as really uncomfortable. But that discomfort in itself is inherently what breeds that growth. So when they start to fall mm. in love with that awareness process and that cycle of, oh my God, I'm observing that I have this old behavior. and Oh my God, I see exactly where it comes from. And mm. silly me, I have the power to change this. And then they change it. Mm. And I get these long winded texts about dementors that they conquered or mm. um, new jobs that they're going out for. I mean, it parlays into 
everything in a human being's life, sexuality, mm -hmm. um, interpersonal relationships, career, physical transformations. It doesn't stop in the gym. It starts there. Yeah, I love it. Hmm. Very cool. And um, yeah, Mac, you also uh, think that we as the human race are lacking connection in general. Uh, what is true connection in your opinion? What we're doing right now, just sitting down and exchanging ideas and beliefs and being willing to sit with the energy of another individual and acknowledge that they matter and acknowledge that whatever it is they're going through, whether it's spoken or unspoken matters. Mm -hmm. And as human beings, our, our purpose, I believe, is to discover that acknowledgement and then put it into practice daily. Love it. And how do you feel like uh, this is sort of working in the digital age? Is the digital sort of scene helping us or is it sort of creating more of a or less of a connection? I think it can help us. I think it's a new form of communication. Um, so when I was getting my degree, it was the beginning of this, it, like Twitter, which just being taken seriously. And that's because the president wasn't using it. Right <laughs> but <laughs> my international <laughs> clients come on and they're like, hey, uh, is everything okay over there? You guys good? Is everything on fire? I'm like, no, we're fine. Just, just Twitter's on fire. Don't worry about it. Um, but I, my bachelor's degree is in mass media communications and mass media communications became mass calm and digital media so it's not mutually exclusive from oh it's just something that kids do to connect like this is a primary modality of dialogue for every human being on the planet like there's a several billion people on instagram now that's insane mm. that's insane but because influencers which is why i won't use this term have come in and decided that it's about what they look like and who they can have sponsor them or mm. whatever. And there's some degrees of this influencership that can be pretty dope, which I mm. saw and chose to use in our business model. Mostly because what I was seeing was so fucking bad. Mm. You know what I mean? Like it wasn't about anybody else on the receiving end. It wasn't about humans behind usernames. It was about likes and comments and shares. And that's not what humans are here to do. Humans are here mm. to connect to exchange and dialogue and i think all it takes and i know this for a fact because i respond to everyone whether you're creepy or not you get a response <laughs> but that's because i know that behind creep a is a human going man i'm fucking lonely and there's something on this that resonates with me so you get some love too like there's no reason to make this a, a sexism argument there's no reason to make it a um, digital media versus a primal existence argument. Mm. Like it again, sitting as the bridge in the middle. I think that there is something to be said for quality communication in a digital age, and all that takes is that acknowledgement that the other person receiving your message is a human too. Hmm. And, and so, so Mac, when you like when we say go to dinner and you you look at a family, for example, and basically all the families on their phone and not speaking to each other. Yeah. What, what are your thoughts on that? I mean, that's sort of like, to me, that's like, we, we're kind of losing connection, you know, um, even though maybe you are it, talking to another oh, person on the other side. I, I think we're absolutely losing connection in a physical sense. Um, and I'm very, very grateful to be in a partnership where we're very conscientious of that. Um, mm. We're in the middle of a mild unplug as we speak, like, Look out, Netflix, we're cutting you out. And they're like, we don't fucking <laughs> care. <laughs> um, but when I sit at a, and I used to work service industry too. So it was, that's, that's how my partner and I met. Um, it, it was a little off-putting to see that. Um, mm. As an outside observer, it's extremely off-putting to see that. Especially when you're on a date. Like, you think you're going to get laid if you're checking the score, bro? Like, put your phone down. What are you doing? Like, she is beautiful. Stop. And vice versa. Like, she's over here, you know, checking the photo or whatever. And I'm guilty of it, too. We're all fucking guilty of it. She's over here, you know, checking whatever. I'm like, there's this beautiful human in front of you that wants your attention and time. 
Why don't you give it to them? You know, how much different would our life, uh, I've made it a conscious effort, like when I'm walking down the street, because I have really bad resting bitch face, to smile <laughs> at someone, not because <laughs> women need to smile more, but just because it's like nice to do. It's like kind of an energetic hug, I think. And I, it's Love funny, it. like when I do that in a social media setting and when I do that in like an interpersonal context, something in them just goes, oh yeah, I'm human, thanks. <laughs> you know what I mean? Oh yeah, no, I'm allowed to be here. Oh, I'm allowed to be happy. Oh, I can just mm -hmm. exist. Like, yeah, you can. Isn't that cool? <laughs> I, love I really that. love both of those things. Yeah, sorry. No, sorry, Craig. I was just going to say, I just love the resting bitch face. So. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I reckon I have like concentration dick face. Like, like. That's true though, bud. Yeah, I know. I totally know, bud. <laughs> well, but I love that. Okay. Go, go ahead, on. go ahead. No, no, go ahead, go ahead. Um, this one time I was in this one experience that I will not name. And I was told my smile was too big. <laughs> and then I was in a relationship wow. for too long where he was like, you could land airplanes on your teeth. Hmm. Wow. Wow. I'm like, well, okay, so I just won't smile. Smiling is bad. Sounds and now a I'm bit jealous. Like, I feel like Buddy the Elf. I'm like, I love smiling. Smiling's my favorite. <laughs> wow. That's so cool. Uh -huh. It's so sad that that, that, that someone can call you up on, 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 on one of the nicest things possible smiling. You know what I mean? Mm. It's just a reflection of that. <laughs> yeah. Fully. It totally yeah. is. Fully. Yeah. And you know, Mac, you, you know, you kind of touched on it here. Communication, right? This is obviously such, we, we love talking about communication and, and obviously you are an, an absolute great communicator and, um, it's a, it's really important for a well-functioning society, in your opinion. We've, you know, we've read you say, or heard you say, but what what is it about communication, and and how can we improve our communication skills a little bit? What are you, have you got some like tips or some thoughts on on maybe improving our journey with with communication? Just give a shit. Just be present and give a shit. Mm. Like stop worrying about what you have to do next or what this person thinks of you and just listen, read something without judging it, be present, watch something new, expose yourself to new information mm. daily. You know, you don't know it all. I, we all have to remind ourselves of that every single day. You don't know it all because you know what? You don't have to. It's not that you are not well educated. It's not that you are unworthy of meaning and meaningful interaction right like we're just going through it together like what would it take for you to smile at your barista and say how are you doing today hmm. hi can i get a grande non-fat yeah it'll be 750 yeah you know what i mean like I'm on a first name basis with all my baristas almost to an embarrassing degree. So like, I <laughs> love them a lot, but I just think it's a, you know, just this, it's not, it's not that hard. It's not that hard. It's not that hard to listen to someone and care. It's not that hard to, maybe it is, maybe I'm a freak of nature. I don't, know. I don't think it's that difficult to, to just care. 100%. Once again, is that some I think that comes from, it's yeah. it's probably from knowing what it feels like to not feel heard that that sensitivity and empathy is there that's mm -hmm. the theme i find not just with myself but with my friends and with my clients that we are the way we are because of how we've been treated or the experiences that we've had in the past and that's why we choose to write a different narrative in our daily lives hmm. Hmm. wow great advice there uh, so Matt, kind of just to maybe bring this home a little bit, uh, yeah. what are two great bits of advice that you could offer people listening that have helped you in your life? If it was easy, everyone would do it. Just for my boxing coach hmm. and just show up. It's for my mom. Hmm. Beautiful. Oh, can I, can I add in a bonus one for my dad? hundred percent. Yes. <laughs> okay. Bonus one. 
you don't have to believe in a God. You just got to know that there's something bigger out there and you're not it. <laughs> I like that. Oh, we like bonus uh, uh, tips there. That was awesome. <laughs> cool humans in my life, man. Yeah. Wow. So, so Mac, look, um, what are you excited about, you know, moving forward, your life, coaching, everything. And, and off the back of that, you can maybe just tell our listeners where they can contact you. Absolutely. What am I most excited for? I've stopped trying to figure this shit out. (laughs) (laughs) Never in a million fucking years did I think that this is where my, uh, passion and unruly energy and talkativeness Uh would land me. However, here we are. Um, I'm I'm most excited for the continued exploration with my partner and working together to create the next phase of this with him hand in hand. Um, He's my best friend and we get to wake up next to each other every day and create awesome stuff that makes a positive impact on people. And then, get to laugh and smoke a joint and watch TV and Mm -hmm. snuggle up and go to bed together. So it's like not a bad life. Um, Mm -hmm. I'm excited to be more present. I'm excited for the lessons that I have yet to learn. And I'm really excited to get some of these seedling projects that I've had in my mind um, and our brainchild um, Mm -hmm. off the ground. We have a membership site that we're working on that will be launched this year. Um, so we're trying to take a lot of the information that I gather and share and teach on an individual scale and, um, broaden it so that it is accessible to any human anywhere. Um, and that's where the transition we've gone from BMAC fit to the human builder now, which is super cool. Mm -hmm. Very excited about that. Um, and I'm excited excited for the things that I have no idea I'm going to be excited about because I know Mm. that there's a lot behind the curtain and if I knew what that was it wouldn't be any fun Mm. love that (laughs) very cool (laughs) and uh, Mac where can uh, people get in contact with you so I am on social media at the human builder Um, there are underscores between those words so the underscore human underscore builder Um, you can also send me an email um, which will be in the link on that Instagram page. Uh, just go ahead and give me a follow. Send me a message. I'm on Twitter as well, which I'm pretty active on. Um, lots of brain thoughts. Share a little bit more of my personal life on Twitter. Um, but online, I, I keep it to messages about how you can uh, start believing in yourself a little bit more and become human as fuck. <laughs> love it. <laughs> love it. Love it. And then just our final question, which, uh, which I kind of love to ask all of our guests is, what does being ridiculously human mean to you? Hmm, that's such a good question. To me, being ridiculously human is accepting this ever evolving, interweaving, ever expanding experience that's combined of good and bad and light and dark and exciting and mundane. And the more joy you find in the experience of it all, the more fun this human thing can be. The more you try and fight it, the more resistant the experience will be. Mm -hmm. But if you can give into it and accept it and have fun with it, and know that there's never been a human journey like yours because there's only one of you and you're creating it as you go. Um, Being ridiculously human is just being a combination of it all and accepting it all for all that it is. I love that. Well, Mac, it's it's been an absolute pleasure and an honor to speak to you. Thank you so much for coming on our show. I think there's a few things that um, I'll, I'll, I'm going to take home from this a lot, actually, and just have to digest a bit further when I when I listen to everything again. But you really are uh, open, and it comes across, and and your smile and your inner smile really shows uh, energetically. And it's it's such a pleasure to be around people like yourself. And I know you mentioned that some people have put you down for your your energy and your, you know, like your, maybe your, your laughing and your loudness, but that's, that's needed. We need more of this in the world, you know, just bring some good energy. So, so thank you for that. And, 
I love that you're bridging this gap as, as you mentioned, like you, you kind of have this, this is something I've struggled with is like understanding where spirituality and the real world yeah. kind of come together. And I think there is an important yeah. place to, to find yeah. that, that place. And I think you've, you bring a bit of both, which makes it very accessible to people. Thank and I you. think that's really awesome. So keep, keep going with that. And um, yeah, thank I just you. love what, you, what you're doing and what you represent in the world. So thank you so much for, for that. I appreciate you so much. That fills my heart. And thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> cool. And Matt, just briefly from me, I mean, whoever that guy was uh, that said, you know, you, you must stop smiling. <laughs> Uh, definitely <laughs> needs a little bit of a smack over the face or something like that because <laughs> that is what you know is this is like the true essence of you is your smile you know it, it's just amazing the kind of energy it gives and it's infectious and this oh, is thank you this is what we need in the world we need you know good positive vibes and doing the small things like constantly giving a big smile is what's really going to make a difference and uh, so thank you for having such a great smile and bringing this great energy to the chat. And then also for talking about things which, you know, lots of people kind of don't really talk about. And I think that's really important, you know, create discussion and conversation around these things. Um, because like you said, this is what, you know, makes us human at the end of the day. And by talking about these things more will make us better humans and, um, it's great to have people like you in this world that are human builders and genuinely uh, interested in helping other people. So thanks so much uh, for the chat. Uh, really awesome to to speak with you. And yeah, just wishing you all the best for, for everything that uh, this year is going to offer to you. So yeah, take it easy Thank and have a good one. Thank you so, so much. You, I'm really receiving that and soaking that in from both of you. And um, cool. I just want you to know that I, like, I don't, ever people will be like oh you got like a big social media following I'm like uh okay <laughs> like <laughs> it's just about each individual that that comes across it you know and it's easy to get caught up in the bullshit but a moment like this like i'm really 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 soaking it up and feeling very humbled and grounded into my why so thank you for that and mm -hmm. thank you for allowing me to experience this with you i appreciate it Waking at dawn, packing the gear, September tour and up in the air, stop at the toll, digging.